the book of Isaiah tonight. You know, when we um, began this fellowship, this church, just over nine years ago already, can you believe that? The one of you that was, two of you that were here when we first began, Aaron and, and Trenton, um, we, uh, we began, and I, uh, I've mentioned this before, but I wanted to start with the foundation, the basics, the gospel. We started in the book of Mark. It's to the point. It's quick. It's the gospel message. And then from there, we went to Genesis. And at the time, I would teach uh, Genesis verse by verse at our midweek, and then a topical message from, from that passage of Scripture on Sunday mornings, and we did that through Genesis and through Exodus, and all the while in my mind, I kept telling myself that we would make it through the Bible in about seven years. Well, uh, things actually sped up a little bit because we got to Leviticus, and I got super intimidated about teaching a Sunday morning topical message every week from Leviticus. And verse by verse is one thing, but, but finding, you know, good, solid, every week, hey, here's a whole bunch of take-home information to for application from Leviticus was too daunting for me. And so uh, we, on Sunday mornings at that time, went to Hebrews, which paralleled the book of Leviticus very well. It was really a good companion to Leviticus. And, and from that point on, we kept going through the Old Testament uh, verse by verse. And Sunday morning, we've predominantly been in the New Testament, We've almost taught through the entire New Testament. And, uh, but as far as our Old Testament verse-by-verse verse study, we are now here in the book of Isaiah. But we've, we've come a long way. We've done, done quite a bit of studying this book. And tonight, again, I'm not going to do anything to help uh, getting through the Bible in seven years. So we still have a ways to go. But I'm going to take a little bit of time and talk about the background of Isaiah and, and take an introductory look at... Uh, who he is and what he's about, and because it is one of the colossal peaks of the Old Testament, certainly. Um, and so we're going to look at the context and the world that he lived in. Then we're going to try to, to cover about half of the first chapter. And so uh, we're going to talk first of all about the man himself, Isaiah, and then we're going to talk about the book that he has written, and then we're going to talk about the ministry and the message that he had for God's people. So, first the man. In a way, his name describes his message. Um, Isaiah means Yahweh is salvation. And he was a contemporary. He wasn't a, a lone wolf out there, just, uh, you know, a lone ranger, just spreading God's message. He was contemporary of Hosea and Micah. Um, but he tells us seven times in the book that he is uh, Isaiah, the son of Amos. He tells us that in the very first verse, and uh, this separates him from, there are other Isaiahs found in Scripture, but we know here he reminds us that he is separate from those seven. He is the son of Amos. We know that he was married. His wife was called a prophetess. Uh, they had two children together with interesting, meaningful, and prophetic names. Uh, the name of the first son was Shir Jashub, which means uh, a remnant will return, or, you know, maybe to wrap our minds around a little better, we could say only a remnant will return. Uh, and then the second son, I certainly wouldn't suggest this for your baby name ideas, but uh, I believe it's the longest name in the Bible, if I remember correctly. It's Mahir Shalal Hashbaz. Yeah, it's a dandy. Can you imagine calling that kid at the table every week? Mahir, oh, hush, man, let's get over here right now. Skip the middle name. I don't have time for that. But his name means pillage hastens and looting speeds. Now, if your name has to have a, if the meaning of your name has to have a comma in it, you know the name is going to be long. Pillage hastens and looting speeds. And we're going to talk about those two um, names and why they were called that later and, and in greater length when we get there. But uh, a little bit more about Isaiah. He is a master 
of the Hebrew language. He's been called the Shakespeare of Hebrew. He has the largest vocabulary in the Old Testament, meaning that he uses more words that aren't found anywhere else. Uh, The the sheer volume of of different words he uses is greater than anywhere else. One thing that we're going to find very interesting, and I certainly don't have time to point it all out. We'll look at a couple tonight, but he uses all sorts of different figures of speech to get his message across. He uses uh, hyperbole, he uses simile, metaphors, personification, alliteration, irony, my favorite, sarcasm. Man, just all sorts of different figures of speech just to to grab the attention of his original audience and to grab our attention. It's like, hey, I'm trying in all these different ways to to get your attention so you can hear the message that God has for you. Now, as far as uh, chronologically, he lived from about 740 B.C. to about 680 B.C. Uh, Tradition tells us that his father was the brother to King um, Amaziah of Judah, which means that he he had royal blood in his veins, though he was not in line to become king. That was was his family. He He was royalty. Uh, The Hebrew title of the book is not simply Isaiah. It is the first four words of the book, the vision of Isaiah. And uh, and as, you know, it was kind of a nice break where we had it uh, over the summer, uh, because right now we're heading into a whole nother section of the Bible, if I can put it that way, because um, he's the first of the major prophets in the Bible. And uh, as you may know, I didn't understand this uh, as a kid. I grew up in a religious home, and uh, the the Bible was, you know, went to a Christian school, and I was familiar with the Bible, but uh, not familiar enough to understand that the Bible was not written chronologically. And my Western mind, that's the way I expected it to be written. I expected you start at the beginning and you end in the end. And, and, it, and it seems as though that's how it's written when you start at Genesis and you end at Revelation. But that is not how the Bible is compiled. It's not compiled chronologically. It's compiled by themes. And so the first five books of the Bible, they're called the Pentateuch or the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And then following the law, you have the historical books, starting with Joshua and Judges and Ruth, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles. And then after the historical books, you have the poetic books. And this is the, the portion of scripture that we just finished this past spring, which is Job and Psalms, Proverbs, uh, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. We just finished that. And then after that section, as, as you can see, after Song of Solomon, after the poetic portion of the Bible, now we head into the major prophets. And, and I'll tell you, this is why it was so confusing for me as a kid. I didn't understand that what I was reading in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Hosea, and Habakkuk, and all of those things were happening simultaneously with what I was reading in the historical books. I didn't realize that, that, that he was, you know, his what great uncle or, or his uncle was the king, Amaziah, that we read about, you know, back in Kings and back in Chronicles. And so I didn't understand that, but he's the beginning of the, the major prophets. And uh, that finishes with Daniel. And then finally, there's the minor prophets. They're not minor in importance. They're not the minor leagues. They just had a, a shorter, more concise message. Now, uh, in, in terms of uh, Isaiah and, and the book that he wrote, uh, it, it needs to be said, unfortunately, that Isaiah did write the book of Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah is one of the favorite targets of critics and skeptics, and they like to argue that there must be two different Isaiahs that wrote the book because the second part of the book has such a different flavor and feel than the first part of the book. And we'll, we'll talk about that in, in a second. But there's uh, there's many ways to refute this. There's there is a, a ton of ancient manuscripts, and they all um, attribute Isaiah to one man, to one author. And uh, one of the greatest proofs was the Dead Sea Scrolls. When in 1947, 
uh, a shepherd boy threw a rock into a cave. It hit some pottery, and they went in there, and they found a complete and total book of Isaiah that was about a thousand years older than any other previous manuscript that they had found. And uh, it's, it's also, many of you have heard of the Septuagint. You may not know what that is. The Septuagint was the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And that took place a couple hundred years before Jesus was born. And we know that Isaiah was translated and part of the Septuagint. And, and we'll talk about it in a second too, is that there is allusions to Jesus Christ in the book of Isaiah that are incredible, that are just they will blow your mind. And when you realize that there is no possible way that that was written after Jesus lived, that's when you're really, your just jaw drops at this book and you just fully take in how incredible and how uh, magnificent it is. Now, the greatest proof that Isaiah is the one that wrote the book of Isaiah is what? It's that Jesus quoted the first part of Isaiah, and he said, did you not read that Isaiah said? And then he quotes the second part, the second half of Isaiah later on in the book, and he says, did not that same Isaiah write? And, and he attributes both parts to one man, to one Isaiah. And again, I wish I didn't even have to spend time on this, but this is one of the, the, the popular opinions of critics and, and skeptics and cynics is that there had to be more than one author. But if you're believing that there is more than one author, your problem isn't so much with Isaiah as it is with Jesus, because that now you're calling Jesus a liar, and it always comes back to Jesus. And so um, Isaiah is the third longest book in the Bible, not by chapters, but by sheer volume behind Psalms and, and Jeremiah. And it teaches the, the whole span of God's redemptive plan. And uh, it's sometimes called the Romans of the Old Testament. And we'll see that even tonight, getting into chapter one. And if you guys are familiar, if you remember our study through the book of Romans, Paul begins in the book of Romans, and, and he shows how if you're sucking breath right now, you're guilty before God. You're a sinner that has no hope outside of Jesus Christ. And, and, and Isaiah is going to begin much the same way. You're guilty, you're guilty, but here's what God has to offer you. And so he addresses both past and future events that take place from, the, from, the, from chapter 1 of Genesis to chapter 22 of Revelation. He just covers events and everything in between. Now, and here's what is so interesting to me, and, and um, I, I don't know that the Lord ordained it this way or not, but you may have heard before that not only is Isaiah like the book of Romans, it's the Bible in miniature. The Bible has how many different books? 66. How many different chapters does Isaiah have? But the, the really amazing thing, I mean, because the, the chapters, when Isaiah wrote this, he didn't write, okay, chapter 1, verse 1, and start writing. He just wrote it out, right? The chapters, they were added later. But what is incredible is that the organization of those chapters in comparison to how the Bible itself is set up is really incredible. The 30, with 39 books in the Old Testament and 27 books in the New, the general theme in the Old Testament, 39 books, is reflected and seen in the thir first 39 chapters of Isaiah. I mentioned before that, man, it doesn't seem like... the the, the skeptic says it doesn't seem like one person because there's a different feel to the first half and the second half. And that break is at between chapters 39 and, and, and chapter 40. Just like the break in our Bible is between the 39th book and the 40th book when we get to Matthew. And so uh, the, the unfolding story of redemption and grace that God provides that we read about in the New Testament, well, that's mirrored in the final 27 chapters of Isaiah. And that's his message. That's his theme there, that there is hope, that there is, there is one coming to save us from our sins. Now, as I mentioned, he gives a clear testimony to the work of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and he has the clearest picture of Jesus in the Old Testament. He foretold of the first coming of Jesus and even his virgin birth. He speaks of the forerunner, John the Baptist, coming and, and, and leading the way in that ministry. It speaks of the anointing that Jesus had on his ministry. And uh, in Isaiah 40, Chapter 40, chapter 49, chapters 
50 and 52 through 53, he speaks of the servanthood. They're called the, the, the servant songs. Uh, and it speaks of the suffering and, and the, the servanthood and the sacrifice of Jesus. And then specifically, if you're not familiar with Isaiah 52 and 53, I'm going to give you some other homework tonight when we're done, but read Isaiah 52 and 53 because it reads like someone and again, this is why the skeptics have such a huge problem with it. It reads like someone who is familiar with Jesus' death on the cross, like someone witnessed it, like someone saw that, like someone was speaking about a past event. But no, Isaiah was speaking about a future event. It's incredible. And uh, it's found, that kind of work is found nowhere else in the Old Testament. It's the book of Isaiah. It's that portion of Scripture. If you remember in, uh, what is it, Acts chapter 9, that the Ethiopian eunuch was uh, in his chariot and he was reading, and he was saved through the reading of Isaiah. Those, those two chapters, 52 and 53, are alluded to about 50 times in the New Testament. Um, and so um, Paul in, in writing, he references or alludes to the book of Isaiah about 80 times. This is a really important document, a really important work in the redemptive plan of God. And so uh, he writes extensively, not only about his first coming, but the second coming. One of the most common phrases that we're going to read in the book of Isaiah is the day of the Lord. Speaking of this time when, when Christ will come with a, a finality, he will crush Satan and the, uh, the rebellion and, and uh, the kingdom that Satan has placed in, in contrast and in, in um, opposition to the Lord. And, uh, and so now we've looked at the man, the book, and now the message and the ministry. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this right now before we jump in. And then we're going to talk a little bit more. Uh, we'll give a little bit more context about Isaiah's day as we get going in. But he began his ministry... Again, you find this in the first uh, verse, uh, under the reign of King Uzziah. And again, if he really was part of the royal line and Amaziah was his uncle, this would make Uzziah his cousin. His cousin is the king. And he ministered for a period of over 50 years. That just blows me away. You know, that's, that's Billy Graham type of longevity. Uh, I, I figured it out that if someone, it's like someone beginning their, their preaching ministry, their prophetic teaching ministry during the Johnson administration, and here they are in the Trump administration, and they're still teaching and preaching away. Um, and so this is an incredibly critical point uh, in the histories of both the, the northern ten tribes of Israel and the southern two tribes of Judah. And uh, when he begins his ministry, and, and we'll probably see this a little bit as we get going on later in the book, Israel and Judah, in a sense, are flourishing. The two nations, if you, if you combine them, had an area about as large as they had ever occupied, even under David and Solomon. And, all, and, and it appeared like things were just going to get better in, in much of the way. King Uzziah was amazing. Let me just read this to you from Second Chronicles 26. It said, Uzziah prepared for them, for the entire army, shields, spears, helmets, body armor, bows, and slings to cast stone. And he made devices in Jerusalem, invented by skillful men, to be on the towers and the corners to shoot arrows and large stones. I read this and it's like, okay, he invented the catapult or the trebuchet or something, you know. And so it says his fame spread far and wide for he was marvelously helped till he became strong. And so on one hand, Judah, the nation that Isaiah is living in and that, that's the primary recipient of his message, things are rocking for Judah. On the other hand, things are quite precarious. It was during his life that there's this new Gentile power that is rising into existence. Egypt had one time, you know, been the dominating force, but now there's a new, there's this new upstart empire that's beginning to, to grow and, and gain power. And uh, it's Assyria. They're coming from the north, northeast, and uh, they are threatening both Israel and Judah. And uh, if you are familiar, you'll know that uh, it was Assyria that took the northern kingdom of Israel captive. They delivered judgment to Israel, and um, they are also going to be a warning uh, to Judah. 
just about ready to get into verse 1 of our Bible study. Let me remind you to silence your phones real quick. If you texted me, shame on you. Um, tradition says that Isaiah was sawn in two by Hezekiah's son, Manasseh. Manasseh was probably the, the, the wickedest king of all the kings, and uh, certainly of Judah. And I could I would love to talk more about Manasseh. His life is incredible. Uh, the amount and the volume and the severity of the sin that he was involved in. But we find at the end of his life, he repented and God received him and God took him back. And uh, that's a great story of grace in and of itself. But tradition says that uh, Manasseh had him sawn in two. And it would appear that the book of Hebrews validates that tradition. If you remember in Hebrews 11, in the, in the hall of faith, it says that there was trials. Some had trials of mockings and scourgings. Some had chains, imprisonment. They were stoned. It says, yes, they were sawn in two. And it seems as though perhaps that was speaking about the prophet Isaiah. And uh, as we'll see tonight, man, he, I, a man that was as sinful as Manasseh and someone like Isaiah, there's going to be some conflict because Isaiah was bold in speaking the truth and it ended up costing him his life. But he couldn't help be bold. He had the word of God in his mouth and he had a love for the people in his heart. And if I can just give some application even before we get into the Bible study, if we can learn that, from the prophet Isaiah, we're doing well. If we can have the word of God in our lips, in our mouth, that that's what we're speaking, that's what we're saying. And then we have the love for the people in our hearts. That's an effective witness. That's powerful. That's going to reach people. It's going to change lives. And who knows, maybe even though Manasseh sawed Isaiah in two, maybe there was something that Isaiah said way back then, before he died, before he was martyred, that touched and changed uh, the, the hard-hearted Manasseh. So uh, 25 different times he calls Judah my people. He connects with them, even though he, he has to deliver a message at times that is extremely harsh and difficult. He says, this is my people. And uh, because he loved them, he just he pleaded with them to return to the Lord. They had forgotten him, turned their back on him. Now, as I mentioned when I was talking about figures of speech, he uses all sorts of word pictures to grab their attention. We'll read in chapter 1 that he, he's going to call the, the nation diseased. He's going to call them a harlot. Uh, he calls them a crumbling wall. It goes on and on, but he, it's just a, a rest of their attention, to grab their attention. And yet, although he used such vivid word pictures, the people often just ignored his warnings. And uh, he was preaching to people, much like if you remember that Paul warned Timothy and said, hey, in the later days, there's going to be people that, uh, you know, are not going to put up a sound doctrine, but they're going to heap up for themselves teachers that their itching ears want to hear. You know, they're going to turn themselves away from the truth. That's the type of people that Isaiah is teaching, was trying to reach. And, and those people are always around. It wasn't just in Isaiah's day. It wasn't just in Timothy's day. It's in our day. And, um, and so in that way, even though it was written to Judah 2,700 years ago, we're going to read through this. And, and although we're not Judah, we're the church, we're still God's people, this, we're going to find it so relevant for us. And especially those of us who are, have this attitude of, and I'm not trying to say this is you or anything, but, but for people who call themselves believers and have this attitude that says, I'm doing okay without the Lord's leading in my life. If, if that's the attitude that we have, it makes this message of Isaiah extremely relevant for today, as we'll see. Now, my hope is to get through um, most of the first chapter, but we can't do that unless we begin. So let's actually study the Bible in our Bible study. Chapter 1, verse 1, we'll read that, and then I'm going to do a little bit more context. Um, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. And so in verse 1, right off the bat, he tells us who it is, uh, the what he is doing, and uh, the when. He's telling us through the reign of these four kings. 
And he calls what we're about to read, the rest of this book, the vision of the Lord. And although some prophets re- received the message from the Lord that way, most of the time it was a hear from the Lord and repeat it back to the people. Isaiah specifically mentions out here in verse 1 that this is what the Lord has shown me for his people. And now I'm going to tell you what the Lord has shown me. And he says this is for the people of Judah and Jerusalem. Now, We've made it through this verse, but let me just give a little bit more background on what's going on in the nation of Judah. The, uh, the, the ten tribes, as you know, split. They were uh, unified under Saul, somewhat, uh, under David, under Solomon. But after Solomon died, Jeroboam rebelled in the north, and the twelve tribes were split. The ten tribes in the north retained the the name of God's people, and they are referred to as Israel, while the two tribes in the south retained the royal line, the line that the Messiah was to come through, and and David's line. And they are simply called Judah. It was Judah and Benjamin, and they just kind of got absorbed into Judah, the, the more dominant tribe. And so, Although the message that we're going to read, and especially in the first years of his ministry, there's things for the northern tribe to to glean and to learn from. His message is primarily for those who live in the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, as I mentioned, Assyria is a rising power on the world scene. They have been marching west and surrounding the nations close to Judah. Uh, If you read anything about the kingdom of Assyria and their warfare, they were as brutal as it comes. They would uh, uh, take the heads of a whole town, put them on, on, line them up on spikes and poles. And, uh, and it was a warning that Assyria was in town and they're coming for your, your town next. And so um, when this began to happen, obviously the smaller nations, the one that were weaker than Assyria, uh, they felt threatened. And so they formed alliances to defend themselves against this. They could see Assyria is going to be a big dog on the block. And so looking to gain any sort of leverage they could against the Assyrians, the northern kingdom of Israel uh, formed an alliance with Syria. And this is where it gets confusing because it's Assyria is the rising world empire, Tilgath Blazer, all of that. But they formed an alliance with Syria. So it's Assyria and Syria. And they formed an alliance to defend themselves, hopefully, against this coming world power. But when that began uh, to happen, they wanted the southern kingdom as well to join them. So Israel and, and, and Syria joined together and they said, hey, Judah, join our little club and we'll be even stronger to fight off the Assyrians. Judah um, said, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm, I'm refusing to join your alliance. Therefore, Bear with me here. This is really important stuff to understand the book of Isaiah. Uh, the, as a result of this snub of, that Judah gave, that we, no, we don't want to be part of your group, Syria and, and Israel. Uh, I'm fine with, without you. Israel and Syria said, okay, then we're going to take over you. We're going we're to take you by force. And if you don't want to join us willingly, we're going to take over you forcefully. And Judah, instead, and, and in rather than trusting in the Lord or, or joining their alliance, they actually turned to Assyria and, and they paid them for protection. So I know it's really confusing. And so let me just put it in uh, an illustration, hopefully, that we can understand. Is everybody okay? I know there's a lot of information tonight. Okay, we were all at high school. There's a bully in high school, right? And uh, he is terrorizing the freshmen. He's, he's a junior. He's going to be a senior soon. And the freshmen just know it's a matter of time before this guy pummels them. And so two of the freshmen get together and they join forces and they ask the third freshman, hey, the three of us, maybe we can, we can we have a, ch- a shot against this big bully. But instead of joining his classmates, this third freshman says, no, I'm not going to join you. 
I'm going to give my lunch money to the bully, and I'm going to have him fight you off for me. And so that, that's kind of what's going on here. And well, in the short term, this did help Judah. They were protected against the northern kingdom and against Syria. But once Assyria did come and wipe out the northern kingdom in 722 BC, took them captive, led them away to captivity, uh, Assyria said, what's to keep us? I don't care if you gave me your lunch money. What's to keep us from going after you and defeating you? And, uh, and so that takes us near the end of Isaiah's life when King Hezekiah was the king. And uh, the Assyrians came in force against Judah. They surrounded and besieged Jerusalem. And uh, remember, if you remember the, the account, they were throwing a letter over the top. It's like every other god has not protected them. Your god is no different. Totally trying to put fear into them and mocking them. And the Lord graciously, out of mercy, uh, he, he intervened. He sent an angel. And, and that night, 185 of the Assyrians, it says in the King James, I love this, that they woke up dead. That's a tough way to woke up. I've felt like that before, but they woke up. Hey, I'm dead. Okay. And so the Assyrians then, they never fully recover from that, that one angel encounter. And, uh, and after receiving this protection, Isaiah, at the very end of his life, he's still going to continue to warn Judah because it's not going to end with Assyria. There is another coming world power that's going to come on the scene that they will not be fully protected against, and that is the Babylonians. And they would lead Judah into captivity for seven years. And so it's this coming judgment that, that this Isaiah is just, he knows, he's seen from the Lord. He's had this vision with this heart for the people. And so he, he's delivering to the people what the Lord is showing him. And it says in verse 2, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. I want to point out here God's heart. The very first words from the Lord that we read in this massive volume, this book, this prophecy, is is the Lord saying, I've raised up this nation like children, but they've rebelled against me. This is God's heart. This is is heart-wrenching. And there's nothing more heart-wrenching than rebellious children. And I have seen too many good people with rebellious kids blame themselves. God is a good father. He was good to this nation. He led them. He nourished them. He fed them. But man, we, we have sin just bottled up inside of us. And sometimes it doesn't matter how good of a parent you are, a child is going to be rebellious. And, and if you've got rebellious children, uh, I just want you to take, take some heart there that the, the Lord is a good father and he has rebellious children. But, but you can just sense his heart, his attitude. He, he doesn't immediately, he's not talking down to them. He's saying, you're my children. You're my children, and, and you've revolted, you've rebelled. And, and he says, and, and, if, and if you could picture in your, in your mind now, just like this heavenly courtroom, he's going to present his case against the nation, how, how they, they have wandered from him. They have rebelled and, 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 and breached this relationship that he has with them like children. He says, I've nourished them, I've brought them up. And he says, I've led them, I've, I've taken care of their needs and provided for them, but, they, but they've, they've rebelled, they've gone their own way. They're, they're like the prodigal. They've disregarded the blessings that I've provided, the privileges of being in relationship with me, and they welcome sin. And the Lord is, is, is lamenting in, this, in verse 2, in this, these first words of this prophecy, because he's a personal God, and he says, this is against me, and they've rebelled against me. And so he says, I can prove their, their waywardness in the court of heaven. And he calls two witnesses here. He says, heaven and earth. And, and uh, then he accuses them of breach of contract. Now, I, uh, I may not have time for this, but I want you to turn to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, please. Deuteronomy chapter 4. He says, hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. And he is, he's calling them to witness come here. I want you to witness. And, and he's pointing out that, that Judah, and forgive me if I, I say Israel from time to time, if, if, that Judah has broken their covenant with him. 
Because when the covenant was given with, through Moses, God had certain stipulations on this covenant. There's covenants in the Bible with no stipulation on, on man's side of things. Uh, but here, this covenant, there, there is stipulations. There's blessings that come from obedience, and there, there's curses for the consequences of disobedience. And the Lord says in chapter 4, I called you, I gathered you as a nation, as my children, right after I delivered you and, and brought you out of Egypt. I gathered you at Sinai or Mount Horeb, and then it says in verse 14, you came near Deuteronomy 4.14, and stood at the foot of the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire to the midst of heaven, with darkness, cloud, and thick darkness. And the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of the words, but saw no form. You only heard a voice. So he declared to you, Moses says, his covenant, which he commanded you to perform the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone. And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments. Yeah. Okay, well, if you can't find it, just bear with me and, and listen. Oh, yeah, I started at 11. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Verse 14. Now we're at verse 14. And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments that you might observe them in the land which you cross over to possess. Now that you just found verse 14, uh, look down to verse 23. I'm pretty sure. Verse 23. <laughs> Take heed to yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you. And make for yourselves a carved image in the form of anything which the Lord your God has forbidden you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. When you beget children and grandchildren and have grown old in the land and act corruptly and make a carved image in the form of anything and do evil in the sight of the Lord your God to provoke him to anger, verse 26, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that you will soon utterly perish from the land which you cross over the Jordan to possess. You will not prolong your days in it, but will be utterly destroyed. And so Isaiah begins this vision, speaking what the Lord has shown him by explaining that the time of judgment has come. And he does so by with the two witnesses that were at the very beginning, heaven and earth. And now verse 3, uh, again, my favorite literary technique, sarcasm. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib. Now, the ox and the donkey are some of the dumbest animals. Not only are they dumb, they are stubborn. Has anybody ever had a, a donkey or... Oh, you've had a, oh, they're really stubborn. Yet, with their stubbornness of an ox or a donkey, they're animals that need someone to watch over them. They're stubborn. They act like you don't, they don't need you, but they need you. That's the whole thing. They, they're, they're not animals that like do well in the wild, you know? And so the ox, he knows when it's hungry. I got to let out a moo or two. I got to go to my owner, turn and I'm head to the barn. It's good. And the donkey too, he knows where he belongs. I don't belong out in the wild. I belong there. But he says here, he continues on in verse three. He says, Israel does not know. My people do not consider now, the oxen, donkeys, they know, they get it, but not Israel. They show, they show no signs of attachment to their father, not just a master, but their father. Now, I remember I grew up on a farm, and we didn't have oxen, but we had cows. And uh, when my dad would cut, I'm trying to explain this, and I know all of you didn't grow up on a dairy farm like I did, and so I have to use terminology, layman's terms, right? I have to speak down to you because I'm a dairy farmer, yeah. Uh, when, he, when he cut green grass uh, to feed the cows, because you know, sometimes you put them out to pasture, other times you, just, you cut it and you put it in a, in a big wagon and you bring it in. As soon as they saw the tractor and that chopper out there, the, the cutter cutting the grass, even, while, they, while he's still out there going back and forth, they're lining up at the manger like, he's coming with food, here I am. The, the, I hate cows, okay? 
Cows are so stupid. I met Charity, and she could not believe that I've punched cows before. Like, of course I've punched cows. You'd punch them too if you knew them. You know, they're, they're idiots. They're so stupid. But those cows, those stupid cows, know ba- better and act wiser than the person who turns their back on God. Let that sink in for a minute. That the most stubborn, stupid animals are wiser than a person that turns their back on God. And the Lord says, this is exactly what Judah has done. Check out verse 4. Alas, now this is interesting, or, or woe, your translation might say. It's hoy in the Hebrew. It's from where we get oy vey. Maybe you've heard someone say oy vey, you know. It comes from this word right here. He says, alas, sinful nation. Now here's what's so interesting. And again, I don't have time to point all of these out, but this is what makes Isaiah, he gets his message across so powerfully, but he also does it so poetically. Because alas is the word hoy in the Hebrew, and the word nation is goy. And so he's saying hoy, sinful goy. You know, it just, it grabs your attention. It's got this, this sound that's just going to, to alert you to, to listen. And this is what God is saying. A people laden or, or burdened with iniquity. A brood of um, evildoers. Children who are corruptors. They've forsaken the Lord. They have provoked anger the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backwards. Another thing that Isaiah does quite often, and again, we'll point out some of these as we go, but he uses lists of seven. And in this verse, he uses here four phrases to describe their condition. They're sinful, they're laden with iniquity, they're a brood of vipers, and they're children who corruptors. And there's a progression to those four. Sin brings burden. Sin brings bondage. It makes you laden. It promises, sin always promises happiness and freedom, but it only delivers pain and regret and bondage. Now, notice too, maybe underline this. Not, it doesn't say they're not corrupted. They're actually corrupters. The sin that is burdening them, that's weighing them down, they're actually teaching it to those who are around them. And so you have this progression, they're sinful, they're burdened, and now they're teaching others wickedness and sin and and evil. Then, after the four phrases to describe their condition, he uses three phrases to describe their attitude toward God. They have forsaken the Lord, they've provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel, and they've turned away backwards. There's three they's in there, and this is all their attitude. And and, and this, this nation, that from the very beginning, when it was just before it even germinated, you know, with Abraham, they're called to be the children of Abraham. They've become a family of of vipers. And again, we see this progression in their condition, and it relates directly to the progression of their attitude. They've forsaken, they've provoked, they've turned around and went the other direction. Those things go hand in hand. When you're going the other direction, that's when you're teaching other people how to sin. And so th- this, this doesn't just happen to a nation. It didn't just happen to Judah. It can happen to individuals as well. From being in a relationship with him to forsaking him, slowly moving away from him, responding to the pull of the world and inviting sin into, into their lives and, and then having that sin become bondage and, and until finally you're going the opposite direction and you're saying, come on, join me. Join me in going this way. Now all that's left for this, this, this one verse, this, this hoy, sinful goy, all that's left here is, is for judgment or mercy. There, there isn't another option. And so uh, when they take for granted the salvation that God provides and the blessing that he has provided uh, and, and, and the grace that is available, man, that's all that is left. And so As the Lord watched his people turn their backs on him, it says, you've turned away backward. He asked them this simple rhetorical question in verse 5. Why should you be stricken again? You'll revolt more and more. The New Living Translation puts it this way. Why do you keep inviting punishment on yourself? Man, take a look at your life. It's spiraling out of control. How much worse do you want this to get? I think again of the prodigal, because the Lord's viewing them as a child. 
the prodigal, like, how much longer do you want to spend in the pig pen? Why would you seek out more of what is causing you pain and guilt and hurt and shame and discomfort? Why would you want that? You know, Charity and I had a child. Well, we had four of them, but we had a child that we were trying to free from the bondage of diapers. This child did not want freedom. Uh, they had convinced themselves that going to the bathroom right where you were, anytime you want, that that was true freedom. And we knew it became a problem when we heard this child telling a sibling, hey, you don't need to stop what you're doing to go to the bathroom. Just go right now. Just go in your pants. Just do it. And if you can voice those type of things, you should be going to the bathroom yourself. You know, we, we knew that there was, was something. And so when we, after years of trying potty training and different techniques and, you know, uh, putting Cheerios in there, you know, and all, all the sorts of, of things to, to uh, encourage, giving them treats, to, to get them to be potty trained, when we knew that they knew and it, it just became an act of rebellion that they weren't doing it, that they didn't want freedom from this bondage of diapers, we disciplined. And there was a time that after I delivered this discipline, the child gritted their teeth and said, I like that. Can you believe that? Like, I, will, I will put up with that discipline and I will, I've convinced myself that I've liked the discipline more than the freedom. And, and this is why sin, again, I don't care if this is 27 years ago or 2018, this is, is why sin is so deceptive. There is no reasonable answer to the question that he asks. There is no reasonable answer to why would you walk away from deliverance and towards bondage. You can never justify that. But he goes on and tells them why this is what they keep choosing. It's because they're completely unhealthy. He says the whole head is sick. The whole heart faints. Even from the sole of the foot, even to the head, there's no soundness in it. But wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They've not been closed or bound up or soothed with ointment. Ah, oh, the great physician looks at the nation, looks at his people. He looks at Judah with his chart in hand and he says, oh, it looks bad. It looks very bad. And, and sin had ravished the nation. They're beat up, they're bloody, they're raw, they're festering. Putrefying is one of those words that it's just like, right? you don't even like to hear the word putrefying. It's kind of like moist, right? It's like, no, don't want to hear that. Don't want to hear putrefying. And, and he says, the head is sick. That's where it begins. They're not thinking like they should. They're resisting the Lord. They're disagreeing with what God says for their life. And it affects the rest of their body. It leads to their heart being faint. It's not beating for the things of the Lord like it once did. And the sick head and, and, and the heart faint, it's going to turn into your actions. It's going to end up affecting your feet as well. And so what's going on on the inside, it's going to reveal itself on the outside. There's no part, he says, of the body that's unaffected from the, whole, head, the head to the sole of their feet. Just sores and bruises and open wounds, every type of pain. You understand that's every type of pain, right? There's sores, bruises, and open wounds. And nothing is being done for it. They aren't closed, soothed, or bound. They're completely unhealthy in every way. And they're not doing anything to help their situation, despite God's warnings, despite his grace, despite his, his reaching out to them. Verse 7 says, Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Strangers devour your land in your presence. And it is desolate, as overthrown by strangers. The nation is already, even though under Uzziah, things were going pretty well, the nation is already feeling the discipline from its disobedience. The Assyrians are already making their mark in the northern kingdom of Israel. They're already affecting the, the, the northern part of Judah. But the worst is yet to come. He says, turning your back on God, it leaves you sick, it leaves you empty, desolate. And then verse 8, so the daughter of Zion is left as a booth in a vineyard as a hut in a garden of cucumbers. 
and as a besieged city. All three of these things are, are saying the same thing. They're, they're a spectacle of, of loneliness and emptiness. And this isn't God's desire for them. This is where their, their own disobedience and sin has brought them. But in the midst of that rebellion, God showed grace. Verse 9, unless the Lord of hosts had left, us, left to us a very small remnant, we would have become like Sodom, we would have been made like Gomorrah. The nation, at this point, they'd become overconfident and, and self-confident is, is the problem because they have withstood attacks from the northern kingdom by this point. There's, there's constant little squirmishes between the north and the south. They had withstood attacks from Syria, from the Edomites, from the Philistines. But as Isaiah points out, as bad as it becomes, it could have been worse. Sodom and Gomorrah, even today, are synonymous with sin and wickedness. And they were completely wiped out. But he says, no, the Lord, he's gracious. He left a remnant, not because you were deserving, but because he's gracious. That's, that's why there is a remnant that was spared. And God is always faithful to leave a remnant. And the problem, he's not done with his blistering of the people. The problem started from the top down, verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord. In case you're just thinking this is my opinion, scratch that. This is the word of the Lord. You rulers of Sodom. The king is his cousin. This takes a lot of courage. I don't care what kingdom or nation you live in to address the leadership as rulers of Sodom. That's what he's calling uh, Jerusalem, the, the leaders in Jerusalem. He says, give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. And he's talking to Judah. This is a slap in the face. They knew Abraham. They knew all about the story of sending the angels and wiping out the city, the, the, the fire and the brimstone. And, and, and this is just an affront to them. And he says, it started from the top, but everyone has their part to play. And this Sodom and Gomorrahness, it's permeated my people. I don't think, as he says this, that he's pointing the finger, because we don't want to lose the heart that we found in verse 2. I don't think he's pointing the finger to condemn, but he wants them and he wants us to see the duplicity and the hypocrisy in our lives. And when we can fully see the hypocrisy and the duplicity, then we see the beauty of the grace and the mercy that he extends. When, when I... You know, if you go to a jeweler and you're looking at a diamond, they put it out on something black, right? And then, oh, now you can see that shine. He wants to just spread that black out. Do you see this in your life? It's like Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, I'm going to show you the grace and the mercy, and it's going to stand in such stark contrast to your sinfulness. But he goes on. He, again, he wants to point out their, their duplicity and hypocrisy. He says in verse 11, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? Why do you come to church? Why do you go to worship? That's what he's asking. What's the purpose? Why are you doing this? Because he goes on and says, I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. Although the nation was neck deep in idolatry and wickedness, collectively, they were still practicing all the religious activities. It says here at the beginning of verse 1 that they offered, uh, they had a multitude of sacrifices. It says that they offered the fat of well-fed cattle. In other words, the quantity and the quality of the sacrifices were great. The quantity and the quality of the sacrifices were great. Yet the Lord says, I don't delight in that. He says, when you appear, verse 12, before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? Now get this, not only quantity and quality, but frequency. They're trampling my courts. God says, I, I wasn't asking you to come. Not like this. Says, verse 13, bring no more futile sacrifices. What's the key word there? Futile, futile. 
means vain. It means empty. Oh, you're bringing it with uh, quality and quantity and frequency, but they're vain, they're empty. He says, incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. Then he, look at this, your new moons and your appointed feasts. He's not claiming that. My soul hates. They're a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. Can you believe the Lord is saying this? It wasn't, isn't, and will never be the quantity, quality, or frequency that our Lord is concerned with. It's where the heart is when those sacrifices are made. Both, let me say this, neither sin nor worship, either one, neither sin nor worship begins with outward behavior. Both sin and worship begin in the same place, and it begins in the heart. That's what he's addressing. It's not the outside. Stop it. Stop the outside stuff. I don't want that. From their perspective, and maybe too often from ours as well, they hope that they could go through the motions of, of worship and service and still live their lives any way they wanted to. They're still going to high places. They're sacrificing to idols. They're involved in all sorts of sexual sin. Man, but as long as we do this, we're okay. From God's perspective, without the heart behind it, those sacrifices, it's cheap, it's worthless. It's worse than that. He says it's an abomination. I hate it. It's not that I don't even don't care for it. I hate that. Because the Lord sees, sees, th- he sees through it. He sees through our lives. He sees through the sacrifice. I don't care how, how many cattle you're bringing to be sacrificed. I don't care how, how well fed they are. I don't care how many times you do it. You're wasting your time. It might be easing your conscience, but all it's doing in actuality is increasing your guilt because your heart isn't there. Verse 15, when you spread out your hands, this is the position of prayer. Spreading out your hands, looking up to heaven. He says, when you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. This is such a blistering, scathing rebuke, but it's in love. He says, if the heart's not there, even if the hands are lifted up, all they are is just covered in blood. They're doing everything a good Jew should do, but it was just empty religion. There's no, there's no heart in it. But again, this attitude, again, I'll say this over and over again, whether it was 2,700 years ago, or in our day, or sometime in between, it's always there. In 2 Timothy 3.15, Paul calls it having a form of godliness, but denying its power. This form of godliness, God says, he hates it. He says it troubles him. It wearies him. It's an abomination to him. The Lord's going to say later in the book, He's going to say, people come near with their mouth and honor me with lips, but their hearts are far from me. Man, it's a heart issue. And it's so prevalent even today. The style of a service or the church might be different, but there's always a formalism, this ritualism, this religion that's satisfied with singing and praying and giving, but not having your heart attached to it. That's always happened. It happens today. And, and we, we can do the same thing when we, when we baptize, when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, when we're, when we're serving, when we're involved in ministry, when we're giving financially. We cannot have our heart attached either. But no matter how necessary and excellent those things are, they can never make up for the lack of love in the heart of a Christian. It doesn't matter how much, you, how much you serve, how much you sing, how much you pray, how much you give. This is exactly the reproof that the church of Ephesus received in the book of Revelation. It says, you've persevered and have patience. You've labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. That's a, that's a wow, thank you, Lord, thank you. But nevertheless... I have this against you. You've left your first love. 
God never, man, if there's one message that I want from my life this morning, or tonight, I'm getting used to this Wednesday night thing. If there's one message that I want for my life and my heart this evening, and I hope for you, it's this understanding that God never desires a merely external form of worship. It's never about how much you attend, how much you give, or how well you serve. Every time we engage in those activities, every time we enter into worshiping God in one of those ways, it should be an, ex- an overflow, an expression of a grateful heart. That's what the Lord is concerned about. It's where your heart is. It's got to be about the heart. And to know him is to love him. So the, the more we know him, the more we love him, the more we trust him, the more, the more we, we, just, we, we, we trust his plan for our lives, the more that we do that, the more genuine those things are going to be. And so ultimately, it's, it's fall more in love with Jesus. Get to know him more. Get to know how good, how gracious, and how loving and beautiful our God is. And it's going to be more genuine, more heartfelt. Well, the Lord delivers this indictment, and now he extends an invitation. These next few verses are gold. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Now, we recently, on Sunday morning, we did read from James chapter 4, just the Sunday before last, And it says this in verse 8, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. First command they're giving in in this invitation is he says, wash yourselves, repent from sin. Don't ignore with it, deal with it. Humble yourselves, bring it to the Lord, make yourselves clean. Then he says, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Again, we notice a progression in what he's saying. And this is a great progression. First, you are made clean. Then you put away evil. You cease, you, see, you put away evil doings before my eyes. You cease to do evil. Um, this morning in our family devotions, we read Hebrews 12, 1. And I thought of that. It says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Lay aside everything that entangles I was just at a conference uh, Monday, Tuesday, and, and, the, and the, the conference opened with a message about setting things aside, not even obviously sinful things, but even good things, the things that aren't about the kingdom. Man, have, have everything just filtered through what the Lord has for you in your life. You've got to set that aside. He says, put all that away. After you're clean, being kept clean, now, now you become proactive. Verse 17, learn to do good. Break away from sin in your life. That's important, but don't stop there. Learn to do good. Now, I want to tie this in, and I think this is intentional by Isaiah. Remember verse 4, where it says they were not just corrupted, but they were corruptors. They're teaching it. The Lord says, instead of teaching evil, learn to do good. And learning, learning doesn't just happen. It's, it's a process. And so he's begging them to just live this life of repentance. And repentance isn't just saying, I want to stop doing bad. It's, it's I'm going to stop doing bad, and I'm going to do it about face, and I'm going to go in the other direction. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, flee youthful lusts and pursue righteousness. That's, that's, one, that's one movement. It's not just flee youthful lusts, but it's pursue righteousness. In other words, stop going in that direction and go this direction. He goes on to say, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. Again, back to James. We read in James 1.27, pure and undefiled religion before uh, God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. But this is another progression. Seek, rebuke, defend, plead. Instead of looking out for your own interests, start looking out for the interests of others. This, this, is, this is pure and undefiled religion, that you're not thinking about yourself, but you're loving other people. 
1 John 4, John says this, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. And the Lord, so he offers this, the, 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 the repentant, the humble, true and complete cleansing from sin. Now, verse 18, we're going to stop at verse 18, but man, if you star this, underline it, this is one, such a beautiful verse, such an incredible verse. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Now, although it makes sense that way, the word reason here doesn't mean let's be logical about this, all right? Let's reason this out. It means let's settle this once and for all. Let's stop this back and forth. Stop this hemming and hawing. Let's, let's come to a conclusion. Come now. Let us reason. Let's, let's get to this point. Even though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. I, I think of this verse every time I see it snowing in Ellensburg. Honestly, I do. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Now, again... I, Isaiah is just a master. The scarlet and the red that he's referencing here, I believe it is referring back to the blood that's on their hands. You're offering these sacrifices. You've got your hands, you're, you're, so, you're doing it with, with such frequency. There's blood on your hands. Man, that's, he says, even though they're like that, that's not what the Lord has for them. Even the, the Lord wants them to be fully aware of their guilt and their sin so that this invitation is so of mercy is received. And so this crimson and scarlet, these are the, the, the deepest dyes that were put into fabric. And as you know, once you stain something and dyeing it, there's no getting it out. It's an impossibility. Now here's the thing. The Lord says, wash yourselves, but you can't get it out. <laughs> It's dyed. It's stained. You can't change the situation. But this is how we're washed, by coming to him. He says, come now. Let me deal with it. I want you to wash yourself. Here's how you wash yourself, by coming to me. I want to deal with you. It's not the sacrifices that you bring. It's the sacrifice that I make on your behalf. I don't care how many promises you make. They're not going to clean the stain of our lives. Good intentions aren't going to remove the, 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 the stain. Being better than the average person is, is not going to take away that, that dye of sin in our life. If, if you want the stain of sin removed from your life, he says, you have to come to me. There is no other way. That is the way. No amount of attendance or tithing or serving or sacrifice will bring it. It's not the blood in your hands that, that, that makes them white as snow. You're not sacrificing. You know, that's not, it's not the blood on your hands that's making you white as snow. It's the blood in the hands of Jesus. That's what's making you as, as white as snow. That's the only place that forgiveness is found. There's only one way. There's only one place to have sin removed, and that's by coming to Jesus. Come now. Come now. Let's settle this. Man, John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Not covers it. Not, no, it takes it away completely takes the dye out of our lives. Second Corinthians says, He became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't just take out the sin. He provides righteousness for us in that place. That's so incredible. That's the invitation for us as, as we are going to continue on next week in the book of Isaiah. It's come now. Come. Come ready to have your life exposed. Ready to hear what I have to say to you. Come humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and I will lift you up. I will wash you. I will cleanse you. I will make, even though your sins are as scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. Even though they're red as crimson, I'll make them as white as wool. That's the invitation that we have. Amen? Let's pray.